Hello, how are you? I wish we could be together in real time so that I could hear your answer to that question. If you can, hey, come to my online office hours and say hello. It'd be really nice to meet you. In this video, I'm going to take you into an example of phyletic evolution within human evolution to show you how um, unsimple evolution is. You're now familiar with these distributions and how evolution is the process of how distributions of a phenotype shift over time from one population to the next. Populations evolving. You're also familiar with how the taxonomic system that biologists use is ill-suited for capturing this dynamic process. Since variation shifts gradually over time, be it over hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years, biologists have to decide where to draw the line between one species and the next. Should we draw the species distinction here or here or maybe here or maybe here or here or here or there? Okay, you can see how parcelating a continuously variable phenomena over time becomes a topic of significant debate. But what isn't debated is that the change over time occurred. The evolution happened. Human evolution is a story that begins with the first appearance of life on Earth billions of years ago. More specifically, though, our lineage's unique part began about 7 million years ago with the last common ancestor we shared with chimpanzees. Through selection and drift, the two lineages diverged. Chimp ancestor, the chimps' ancestors went on their own path, and ours went on their own path. The earliest phase of our evolution is represented by fossils we put into the genus Ardipithecus. These primates lived in more forested environments. They walked on two legs, much like we do, but they also retained adaptations for climbing, such as long arms and fingers, and a divergent big toe that is useful for, foot gra um, for grasping with your feet. Features that are very much not like humans today. By four million years ago, we're finding fossils that were making their way in the world quite differently from Ardipithecus. Scientists put these animals into a separate genus to reflect that major shift. Australopithecus, they were also bipedal, but they, were, they no longer had the hand and foot adaptations that would have made it easier for them to climb trees. The benefits of walking on two legs had proved to be so useful that over millions of years, the populations gradually shifted away from tree climbing and were more and more suited to bipedalism. We think that being able to carry small children and provisions was key to the was the key benefit, and this meant they could take advantage of resources in a wider variety of environments of environments, not just forests. The third major transition in human evolution, as you know is indicated by the genus Homo. Around 2 million years ago in the fossil record, we start to see hominid fossils that have larger brains. They're fossils associated with stone tools and animal butchery. These are the remains of people who were able to survive in an even wider range of environments. For the first time, we start to see evidence that our ancestors were living not just on the African continent, but also across Eurasia. Much of what we know about this very early global diaspora is from the stone tools they left behind. Let's check those out. The very earliest stone tools are from about two and a half million years ago. Dr. Seleshi Samal, pictured here, he leads the research team that discovered these, but those tools, they're essentially just rocks, broken kind of any which way. You can see one here. Something shifted around 1.7 million years ago. Hominids started making tools that conform to a, to a template. 
So over and over again, we see the same handful of shapes, some that are flat across the top like an axe, and others that look like a teardrop. We see these in Ethiopia at a site called Konso, at Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, and we see them distributed over a wide geographic range. In Europe, in the UK, Armenia, Spain, and Asia, China, and the Philippines, and India. Every yellow pinpoint you see on this globe represents an archaeological site that dates to somewhere around 1 million to 500,000 years ago. And the stone tools found at each of those sites, they look amazingly similar. So many of them are in that teardrop shape. I mean, it comes in, in so many different sizes, too. Some are smaller than the palm of your hand, and others longer than your forearm. Some look like they may have been hafted onto a stick and maybe used as a spear, as my colleague in Tanzania is demonstrating for you in the lower left. But others, they're made from rock that would not have been so great for cutting. Perhaps they were more decorative? Perhaps they had meaning outside of their practicality? It's impossible to know for sure, but the pervasiveness of these modified rocks all across the Eastern Hemisphere, that appear in essentially a geological instant, it's nothing short of mind-blowing, at least in my hum humble opinion. Whatever these people were doing, they did it very, very effectively, and they did it across a very wide range of environments. Who were these people? They were Homo erectus, and their bones looked like this. An early representative in the genus Homo from about 1.8 million years ago found from the sediments at the base of the Olduvai Gorge deposits. And this, another skull, that's about 1.75 million years ago from Kenya, a site called Kubifora. And this, an almost complete skeleton of a juvenile boy who died 1.6 million years ago from a site called West Lake Turkana, also in Kenya. And this, different views of the same cranium, a cranium that belonged to a member of Homo erectus one million years ago. And these five skulls from Dimanisi, Georgia. Now I've mentioned them before, as one of them has evidence of having had a disease like syphilis that left the marks on the, the facial bones. Now all of this fossil and archaeological evidence, it indicates that human-like people lived across a vast swath of Earth a million years ago. But we know they were not exactly like us. And we know that our species evolved from Homo erectus. But how exactly did that evolutionary history unfold? <laughs> this is one of the most exciting research areas within human evolutionary science right now, in part because it is so interdisciplinary. To answer this question, you have to pull together data from, from paleontology and archaeology, paleoclimatology, oceanography, geography, and genetics. No one line of evidence can adequately tell us about the events that underlie the evolutionary origins of our species. Let's start at the beginning by learning more about Homo erectus, and then we'll work through the evidence that elucidates the transition from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens. With every new taxon, we see characteristics that, by definition, did not exist in earlier or other taxa. The firsts that we see with Homo erectus include two things we've already mentioned. First, this is the first appearance outside of Africa. And second, this is the first systematic imposition of preconceived form on lithic tools. So that's the more scientific way of saying that hominids all over were making tools that all looked alike. Let's add another one to this. The first basically modern human body proportions. We saw the skeletal differences between Ardipithecus and Australopithecus. 
Remember the divergent big toe? The change in the hand and arm proportions? And there were changes in the dentition, too. But with genus Homo, you see skeletons that have basically modern human body proportions. I'll show you. The wonderful thing about finding partial skeletons in the fossil record is you can learn a lot about an organism by having a sense of the relative size and shape of their body parts. Remember when we talked about all of this towards the end of Module 2? So you've been introduced to the partial skeleton of Ardipithecus ramidus from 4.4 million years ago. The 3.4 million year old partial skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis, often referred to as Lucy, and I just told you about the Homo erectus partial skeleton from 1.6 million years ago. It's a little hard to compare them just by looking at these photographs. Let me show you a figure that is a little more helpful. Here you are looking at a modern human skeleton on the left. A sketch of the Homo erectus skeleton is drawn just to the right of it. They are the same height and honestly, they look almost identical, don't you think? To the right of that, you see two other skeletons. One comes up to about the elbow height of the human in the Homo erectus. This is the Lucy skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis, drawn to scale. She's pretty short, compared to later hominids, standing only three and a half feet tall. Just to her right, though, you see that same skeleton, but scaled up, so she is as tall as the human and Homo erectus. Now she looks quite a bit different, doesn't she? Notice the shape of her pelvis. The blades of her ilia, they, they flare out so much more than the bowl-shaped pelves of humans and Homo erectus, and so not like chimpanzees, if you remember those from the last module. And look at her rib cage. Again, it isn't like a tube so much as it is a cone that flares out, narrow at the top near the clavicle, and then quite broad at the waist. The legs of Australopithecus are relatively shorter, too. The take-home message is on the left of the screen, though. Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. Same genus, same body shape. And this was different from what existed before. The human body proportions evolved from a population that two million years ago, previously, had body proportions like those on the right. While Australopithecus walked on two legs, the bipedalism of genus Homo is particularly good at walking long distance. They weren't just fully bipedal. Genus Homo? <laughs> they were Olympic long distance walkers. These three firsts that we associate with Homo erectus, can we infer anything about what these people, these creatures, these primates, whatever you want to call them, what can we infer about what they were like? What were their lives like? We think that the vast geographic expansion, the tools and body proportions that would make long distance walking much more efficient, we think that all of these may indicate that Homo erectus was so successful because they relied primarily on hunting. And we think they probably did it in groups. Pack hunters, like wolves. If you look at the gray wolf, it's not actually a bad analogy. You see the vast geographic range of the wolf here on this map, all across North America, across almost all of Eurasia and into Northern Africa. This is the most widely dispersed mammal outside of humans and the animals we care, oh, outside of humans and the animals that we carried along with us, like rats and dogs. Wolves did it on their own. And they did it because they're cooperative. They coordinate amongst group members. Now, Homo erectus has those stone tools, maybe language, maybe fire. So following large game animals as they migrate, we know that that could take you very far, much farther than you can go if you are reliant on plants. Think about it. Once you leave your region, you don't know what plants are safe to eat. But big game, mm, you can follow them and go as far as they do. Now, let's look at this transition from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens. As I noted before, there are different types of data that inform on this. Now, 
these data, and they fall into three major categories. We have DNA, we have fossils, and we have artifacts. Now for this module, we're going to stay in the fossil record, archaeological and geological records. These data sets give us the evidence needed not just to show that evolution occurred, but to also be able to know when and where things happened, and what the people looked like. In Module 4, we will bring in the genetic, the DNA evidence, to clarify some major questions that the fossil evidence leaves unanswered. And one more thing I want to bring up as we think across the last million years of time. Do not get caught up in the tyranny of the present. The landscapes in the past didn't look like it does today, and it underwent a lot of change. Sea level, changes in the ice, Ages, they played a major role in the transition of Homo erectus to Homo sapiens. And with that, I'll let you go, take a break, and I'll meet you in the next video.